Welcome to the Rich Dad Stockcast. I'm Andy Tanner, and I'm filling in for the illustrious Greg Author, who is uh, uh, actually away on business. He's in Europe, so we wish him well on his uh, trip, and uh, hopefully he got to take his family with him a little bit and enjoy. And for this week's Stockcast, uh, I get to be the guest host. So I get to be in the host chair asking questions, and I'm going to have a chance to interview one of my closest and dearest friends who also... Uh, works with us at the Cashflow Academy. So I welcome Corey Halliday uh, to the, the first appearance on the Stockcast. That's so right. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for being with us. Yeah, I'm excited and, to be here. And uh, we're going to be talking about, Corey, you're going to find out he is a world-class uh, risk manager. He's one of the best in the world. He's certainly the best person I know personally on risk. <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit about how you manage risk. And it's one of the most profitable and valuable discussions you can uh, be a part of. So we're excited for that. Uh, orders of business. Uh, we always do a small disclaimer. Just let people know we're here to educate, not advise. And so that's important to know. And then we have, uh, as, uh, as uh, I should mention, we have a, a gift for you called Zero to Cash Flow. And that's going to dovetail very well into our conversation, actually, because I, it's my personal belief that if a person was to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and uh, say, gee, you know, I'd like to have some passive income in my life. I, I only have a job right now. I'd like something else. I think uh, stocks and particularly options are the fastest way to be able to buy something and have it bring cash flow to your life. So uh, if you've read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and you like to have some passive income, some income that comes because of things you've purchased, stocks is a great way to do that. And uh, we can show you how to accelerate that in uh in that uh zero to cash flow class so we hope you uh enjoy that uh tremendously so uh very exciting Corey, to to have you with us uh cory and i have known each other i don't know how long it's been i feel like it's been around 20 years yeah a couple uh, of decades long, i believe yeah a long time i've gotten older you have not aged for some <laughs> reason so we'd like to know that maybe if you know how to manage risk you just don't age yeah. uh, maybe that's what it is but, I think uh, I've looked like I was about 20 years old for the last 25 <laughs> years. So <laughs> you've just been, you're, you're one of those healthy guys that can drop new push ups and everything. So, um, so Corey, uh, I'll let him give a little bit of his background, but I want to explain uh, what this is. In my home country, the United States, there's various uh, different careers you can choose in the world of finance. That, you could be an insurance guy, you could be a hedge fund manager, you could be a broker, and there's various licenses that a person uh, gets. They're called minimum competency licenses, I suppose, and, and, yep. and they'll give you these designations. For example, uh, you know, one of the, the tests I'd feel pretty confident in taking is called a Series 65. I think it's one of the easier ones. Uh, I've taken a bunch of mock tests on it, done very well just out of what I know without even studying. And uh, that's if you want to run a hedge fund, right? You can get $100 million and, you know, go right, bypass all the states, go right to the SEC and manage $100 million or more uh, with a Series 65. That's what you need to do that. So that's not a big deal. That test might take, a, you know, an hour, hour to take maybe. Uh, if you want to work at a brokerage and get paid for facilitating trades, that's a little more involved. That's a Series 7 license. And that one takes it all day. And I wouldn't pass that because I don't remember all the laws <laughs> from 1934 and 33 Acts. That's right. Um, but Corey has something that people probably have not heard of. Corey uh, went and got a Series 4. And that is a designation that is, uh, that is rare, much more rare, far more rare than the other two I mentioned. And uh, that is primarily about an ability to manage risk. So with that, talk a little bit about your background. Um, people think I was a college basketball player. I did not win the state championship with a last second <laughs> shot like Corey did. Uh, we have we have video. It's grainy, you know, but you yeah. can tell it's him. It's not Bigfoot video. It is. It, it is there. It's sort of like that. It was back on like VHS or whatever it was. <laughs> but uh, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, then we'll hop into the discussion. Yeah. So th that's exactly where my basketball career ended, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that was my senior year. And 
surprisingly enough, the colleges were not banging on my door to come play for them. So Andy's career progressed much longer than that, going on to college and so on. But uh, I always loved sports growing up. I loved competition. I loved uh, things of that nature. And, and, you know, I thought a lot about what I wanted to do as I was going through college and nothing really stood out to me. And I found the financial markets through a friend, actually, and just became passionate about it. Uh, loved everything. I just couldn't get enough. You know, I wanted to to learn and understand more. And so it was a natural fit for me to go into the financial markets. Like you talked about, I got my licenses. I got a Series 7 and a ser- and then actually that first as, as you become uh, that and then you work your way up the ladder. And Series 4, most people don't even need that because they're never going to be the option principal, the head of option trading at the firm. And that's what I progressed to over the years. And so I oversaw hundreds of traders and managed the risk for the firm. I did that for a number of years and and was the head of option trading for the firm. I've got some old pictures. I still probably look the same, but maybe I've lost a little bit of hair or something, but <laughs> got some pictures at the CBOE, you know, the Chicago Board of Options Exchange and the old SPX trading pit. So if you've ever watched Ferris Bueller, you see them with the open outcry, you know, like if they're doing the hand signals this way, they're buying. And if they're doing it this way, they're pushing it out, they're selling, you know. And uh, um, so anyway, it, markets have progressed quite a bit. I retired from doing that. Well, it's been 15 years or so that I've been out of that, just managing my own investments, doing other types of investing, uh, teaching at the Cash Flow Academy, which I absolutely love. Our students are amazing, uh, motivated, and we get incredible feedback, unsolicited, where they just say, your stuff, I'm finally making money in the markets. Your stuff has changed my life. And those are really rewarding. So uh, it's just fun to share when you feel like you have a talent it's nice to share that talent and try to help other people and, and help them to develop their talents in the market. So it's been a fun journey. So you're the best risk manager I know. And I, you know, I picture in my mind a trade, you know, I just picture uh, hundreds of traders that do this for a living and they are, you know, taking various risks with, you know, fancy credit spreads and different option contracts. And they've got all this, and you have a dashboard where you see everything they're doing and you got to make sure the firm is safe <laughs> and you got yeah. and still making money. Yeah. <clears throat> and so you're really, you're really the guy in the captain Kirk chair managing the enterprise, you know, at, at every angle. And most people don't have that benefit that I do. Like yesterday, you know, I said, <laughs> we were talking a little bit about the spinoff uh, out of 3M, 3M yeah, and how that, how that, was manipulating options on the on the stock and uh whenever i want to talk shop i get a call Corey, and it's just uh, it's it's my unfair advantage for sure and most people don't get that so i'm excited to share uh share you with everybody yeah. the the second the second thing i'd bring up is we invest based on four pillars and in the zero to cash flow class you'll see me outline those four pillars if you take that free class but the most important pillar of investing by far is risk management and people that have a negative risk always, you know, has sirens and alarms and it sounds scary. Risk is a scary word, but I don't really see it that way because risk is connected uh, to the other side of risk, which is uh, reward reward. Yeah. And, and the, the greatest rewards are tied to greater risks. And so the more, someone starts talking about risk, the more excited I get, because I know there's a proportionality to that, that the more risk we take, the more reward there is. Would you talk about that for just a little bit is, you know, in your life, having made a living as a risk manager, like that's what you did every day. Uh, what does that word mean to you when you hear yeah. risk? Does that freak you out or what? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I, I sleep very comfortably having, the vast majority of my net worth involved in the markets. And that comes back to education. You know, you look at someone like Warren Buffett, he's got 99% of his wealth tied up in the financial markets. 
and he sleeps very comfortably. And he's always done that. And why? Because he really understands a few principles. And I always emphasize you're, it's far more risky to stay in cash than it is to become an investor, to own assets. When you think about the difference, the Federal Reserve, these money printing measures, they're guaranteeing that your money will buy fewer goods and services down the road. They're guaranteeing that. So if you stay in cash, you think you're playing it safe. You're like, oh, I'm I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to be in cash. I'm going to hide out and put it in my mattress. Well, it's not safe. They are eroding that in inflation is just killing your purchasing power. So it'll stay a hundred dollar bill forever, but it'll buy $98 worth of stuff next year and $95 worth of stuff. And pretty soon a hundred dollar bill won't be worth anything. Right. And so we have to own assets. It's clear. The only way that you stay ahead of inflation is to own assets because assets generate returns above and beyond inflation. But we need to do that in a risk managed way. And so it's it's really interesting because when you look at the ability to be in the markets but not have excessive amounts of risk, I can own stock and with a couple of buttons pushed, I can be hedged, I can be protected, I can put my portfolio in a safe state. And then after the turmoil has passed, I can bring it back out of that protected state. You know, we we can utilize things. And this is why the options market was created. It's funny because if you tell someone that you utilize options, they'll usually say, oh, that's very risky and so on. Options were actually created to reduce risk so that you can hedge, so that you can protect your portfolio when needed. And so it's it's counterintuitive to how most people think. Most people think, oh, I'll sit in cash and that'll play it safe and I'll, you know, not invest in stocks and real estate and other owning assets. Well, that's playing it very, very dangerous, actually. And being involved in assets actually increases your probability of success of what you need and where you want to go. So the, you, you made an interesting comment about options being a way to manage risk instead of, uh, you know, being so risky. And I look at options a lot like the insurance that I have on my car or my home or my life or my health. Yeah. Uh, a person would be far in a far more risky position to own a home and have no insurance on that home. That'd be a riskier position. An even worse position would be to ho be homeless. That's a very risky position. Yeah. You're not going to get wealthy being homeless. And so buying a home and investing in a home and having uh, insurance makes sense. Well, what's more likely to burn down in the next five years, your home or your 401k? And, and people, those are the two places where people put most of their money in America. They have it in their house, which you know I don't really think is an asset, a personal residence, and they have it in a 401k. They insure one, but they don't insure the other. Yeah. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, about options, and we'll talk a little bit about that with some metaphors and analogy. But uh, you know, managing risk that's your that's your gig, and I think it's the most important pillar. Uh, yeah. Just a comment or two on uh, you know people are want to be technical analysts and they want to guess which direction the market's going to go. They want to be fundamental analysts and p pick out which company is best. Why is risk management the most important pillar? Yeah, I mean, in anything that you do in the markets, you utilize risk management so that you improve your probability of success long term. And so when we look at it from the standpoint of most people, they like you talked about 401ks, they simply succeed if the market goes up, but on any market downturn, they're getting destroyed, right? That, and it, this can happen. You can have a Japanese scenario where markets go down for multiple decades. Imagine yeah. if we go through a 30-year cycle where U.S. stocks go down, you know, and have no real return for 30 years. Well, what options utilize is a couple of things. Number one, they can protect you from the downside. So they're going up in value while your portfolio is going down. So now you're not losing, but 
maybe more importantly in that scenario would be the income that they generate because yeah. the the options market can generate like we look at dividends are fantastic right when buy a stock it pays a four percent dividend i've got four percent coming in if inflation's running at two percent hey my dividends are making more than inflation but what if i could double maybe triple that dividend by bringing in income from options what if i can start and that's what they allow us to do is basically we can sell conservatively and not aggressively conservatively some options where we generate a few extra percent per year and it might not sound like much but man a few extra percent per year millions of dollars it's millions of dollars when compounded over an extended period of time so uh it's meaningful and that's one thing where people i don't think think about the I mean, there, if we look at economies around the world, most markets go through a cycle where there's a multi-decade stagnation, uh, downturn, something to that effect, like Japan has experienced. And the U.S., as we get older, um, as we progress in that state, we're not we're not really teenagers anymore as a U.S. economy. We're, we're getting older, and that's usually where you run into some of these things. And I think options are going to be the way of the future because while your stocks aren't doing much of anything, maybe for a decade or two, you could be generating some serious income on the option side. We're going to come back and talk more about that. And uh, there are, there's literally millions of dollars at stake. There really is that people fail to collect uh, that are doing, uh, that are in equities anyway, in 401 k So we're going to yeah. take a little break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about risk management. We're going to talk more about options and be more specific about how they actually work to manage risk and how they actually work to bring in income. So, uh, if you'll hang tight, Corey, we'll have a little commercial break. So far, it's been great. I needed a source where I could really enrich my education through stocks. I didn't really have an avenue for it. And it's helped me a lot. The simplicity has really gotten me on the track to where I enjoy the learning as well as it's really solidifying in my mind. And like they're not just trying to sell you something. They really care about the people that are in the course and they really do care about you and your personal goals and what you want to do is to help you and your family and whatever your goals are in life through that. So it's really been great. So we're back with Corey Halliday. Uh, one of the most important members of my team for sure. He's our resident risk manager at the Cashflow Academy. He trains all of our coaches, uh, even delves in a little coaching himself, uh, mostly because he just loves doing it. Uh, do. we, we don't burden him too much. Uh, you know, he, <laughs> we, the Corey gets along great right with the Cashflow Academy because we don't cut into his golf time. That's right. And so, uh, <laughs> so he lives a pretty good life. <laughs> and uh, likes to hit the golf ball a lot, but you've earned it. You've you've uh, you've come to that place by investing well and being educated. I, I've got I'm some get... breaking news on that front, Andy. I'm going to be at the Masters on Sunday. Oh, Can are you, you really? That? I've got a That's friend gonna... that, I... that got us tickets, so I'm going to be there when the 2024 champion is crowned how about that oh that's gonna be fun man i you know it's it's funny we love Corey and i are kind of basketball golf sports nuts and so we're always finding ourselves at that's right i mean we've been to mma together for crying out loud yeah. so it's we love all that stuff so uh so Corey, we were talking a little bit about options and i'm gonna talk to people about acceleration and i hope people do take the zero to cash flow course because it's a first step and I'm going to frame this with an analogy. I, I have a calculator that I'll put people in that lets them know where they are in relation to where they want to be. In other words, I'll say, all right, what do you want your retirement or your exit of the rat race to look like and how fast you want to get there? And all I need is those two things, how fast you want to be there and what do you want your life to look like? And we can actually purchase that life. There's, there's no life that you can live that you couldn't put a price tag on. If you want to go uh, on a world, you know, tour, or you want to be a, have a insane vacation every month or every week, we can price that out. No problem. So one of the things we're really good at is helping people decide what their, their life wants to be like, and then how fast they want to get there. And as soon as I have that, I say, okay, how much money do you have right now? And they tell me, and I say, here's what you got to do. What I found, uh, 
with the vast majority of people. It's very rare to find someone who's on track. Almost never happens. Uh, I look at the vast majority of these people and they have a problem with vehicle. You know, they have a problem with speed. Um, you know, the, the market, if you're a capital gain person, you know, it's going to give you eight to 10% a year. That's what it's done over the last, you know, 50, 80 years, whatever it is, eight to 10%. Um, and people struggle, you know, to get where they need to be with that. Right. And so let's make an analogy here. Let's say that a person wanted to go to the city park and their goals are small and they're close by. They're not a far, you know, they're not far from their goal and it's not a grandiose goal. So we have uh, the, the smaller the goal is, the closer it is. So maybe I want to go to the city park. Maybe it's a mile from my house and I want to go there. So I might say, well, I could walk there, but maybe I take a bike ride and get there faster. So a bicycle is more complicated than walking, but a, a young little, a young little uh, child can learn to ride a bike. It's not that tough to do. And uh, I feel pretty good if my son, when he was young, says, hey, I want to I want to go, uh, go ride my bike down to the park. Dad, I say, okay, go ahead and go. It's not that tough to do. It's a small goal. But if a person wanted to visit a national park, maybe they want to drive, you know, to Yellowstone and it's four hours from wherever you live. A bike isn't going to get that done if it's four hours by car. And when my kids started to drive, uh, the first time they, you know, they go off on that, on that car on their own, you know, there's that thing's moving a little faster and you can really, you know, there's higher amounts of risk because now you've got, you know, more speed involved. You know, you're going a longer distance. Other people are driving. It's a more complicated thing. And we manage those risks with driver education, uh, driver education. But if a person has bigger goals and they, they live in Texas, and they want a vacation and retire in Hawaii, uh, they're going to take a boat or a plane and a plane is going to get you there faster. Well, now you've graduated from this little thing with two wheels and pedals. Now you have a big metal tube that weighs, you know, huge, <laughs> you know, you're 30,000 feet in the air with something that weighs a lot and, and you're traveling, uh, you know, four, 400 miles an hour through the air. Those risks are almost unfathomable to someone who would have lived, uh, you know, 200 years ago. They wouldn't yeah. even have, have, have thought of, of, of that idea. <clears throat> and, and here's what I think is the most interesting. Of those three modes of travel, if you look at the data, you would say, well, by far the plane, you know, if I put, if all of a sudden I snapped my fingers and everyone listening found themselves behind the cockpit of a 747 having to land the plane, they'd probably lose their mind, right? Yeah. I know I would. I would. And yet, and yet, of those three modes of travel, uh, flight is the safest. Most people get where they want to go, when they want to get there safely than any of those modes of travel. And the, uh, the, the, the amazing part of that is, is one thing. It is the education of the pilot that manages those risks. And that education is so effective uh, that, that his heart rate doesn't get up. And I, I've known a lot of pilots in my day, and their physiology when they drive to the airport, their heart rate doesn't get up. You know, it's like you and I driving to the grocery store. Yeah. And when they get behind the cockpit of the 747, their heart rate doesn't change either. It's just another vehicle. It's another thing. And it's, it, it, and I feel like people should know that's, that's Corey's life. I have never seen your heart rate go up <laughs> in 20 years of knowing you. Uh, we've seen a lot together in the markets, including COVID. We traded that together uh, yep. during that time. Bat we batted, uh, we batted a thousand. We, we, we have a, an annual event and in 2020 it was during COVID and every single trade, it was so easy though. Cause it's shooting, yeah. I mean, it's going down. You got the direction, right? It's pretty shooting easy to, fish in a barrel. <laughs> it really was. I mean, it was, it was probably the easiest year we had because you know, it was very, very simple to, to do. Can you talk about that confidence for a minute and how that's a gift you can give people? Yeah. I mean, it's something that education dispels fear, right? And so the more you learn, the less fearful you are of the markets. And it's the same way. I love your analogy because the more you learn about planes and about flying, the less fearful you are, right? This, the data, the statistics, the knowledge that you have, all of a sudden you go, 
well, this isn't scary at all. This is the safest way that I can travel. And it's the same thing I was saying earlier about being in cash seems safe. It's like climbing into a car. Most people's heart rate doesn't change at all. But a lot of people, when they get in a plane, they feel really nervous, right? And it's education. It's not understanding the statistics and the data and so on. And it's one of those things that the more you do it and the more you learn about it, all of a sudden you're sleeping just fine in the plane and you're not worried one bit and you feel a little turbulence and you're like, this is normal. This is commonplace, you know, and, and that's where the markets are is a lot of people have that fear of getting started, but just take that first step, you know, just understand that as you start to work your way into the markets, it's not that you're going to be risking enormous amounts. You can buy a couple of shares of this, a few shares of that. You can start to dip your toe in and start to see how it works. I mean, what we love is that there are practice trading accounts where you can use flight live simulator. market data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're using a flight simulator for the markets. You're using live data to track your performance, to see how your investments are doing, to practice some option things before you actually go live into the markets. And again, that builds confidence. That builds that that understanding of, oh, I know exactly what I would do. And, and that's where risk management comes in is it's a what if question. Well, what if it goes here? I know exactly what I'm gonna do. Well, what if it goes here? Oh, I've got a game plan for that. And we have that when we understand, when we gain that education. And so now we're not fearful at all. I know exactly what's gonna happen if it goes, up, if it goes down, if it goes sideways, I've got a game plan for all of them. Probably the way we like to do it is maybe we can put on trades where we're directionally in, it doesn't matter what's going to happen. Yes. We're non-directionally trading, meaning we can put on a trade that starts with an 85% probability of success. Most of them are just going to come in and work pretty well. And the ones that don't, now we've got the what if. Well, if it goes here, I manage the risk. I keep the loss contained. Done. You know, and so that's education is just huge. It dispels that yeah. fear. It takes that away and just really builds confidence in people. People don't realize the high probability trading. Uh, for example, I was updating. I use Dow Chemical a lot for an example because of when I bought it. I bought it in COVID, right? When it fell. Yeah, And I've traded options on that every single month for now four years. And uh, my success rate's 90%. And people, I mean, and the 10% you can manage, you know, when yeah. it doesn't fly. So 90% of the time when I make a call, I know, and guess what? I will tell you that five years from now, I can come back and say, yeah, in the last five years, I've been 90%. And 10 years from now, I can tell you because it's this, it's like a casino that you run. Yeah, And the casino can predict what their percentages are going to be. It's not that tough. It's just math. And I'd, I promise that we talk a little bit about options. Um, I would not buy real estate without debt. I wouldn't do it. There's no yeah. way I'm going to save my way to buying houses. It's not fast enough. It's It doesn't go fast enough. And I think you have more risk not using you, using debt then you wouldn't using debt and real estate. Well, the same is true with options. Um, and I talk a little bit about this. Options give you choices, rights, and guarantees. Yeah. Um, in other words, if you're nervous about where you could sell something because you don't know where the price is, for a very small amount of money, you can buy the, the right to sell at any price you really want to. Could you talk yeah. about how important the, 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 the control is in, in options on the protection side? Yeah, it's it's huge. And this is when we talk about 401ks, they are pure directional. You, they only make money if it goes up as it's going down. People can spend years not making anything right yeah. with a small amount of capital, you know, one percent, whatever it may be, you can insure your portfolio so you can say, OK, well, if it goes up, great, I'm going to keep making money. Uh, my portfolio is going to be doing just fine. But what if it goes down? What in that scenario? And so now if we spend just a little bit of premium in those market environments where the market's struggling and downward trending, and we spend that little amount of capital, well, next thing you know, as that stock 
as your as the market declines, that premium that we paid goes up in value. And so now you're offsetting risks. Losses, you're minimizing yeah. the downside. And that's huge. I mean, imagine an environment like COVID where the market falls 30%. Even if you could have made 10% on the hedge to, to do 10% better during the decline and then fully get the recovery is a huge difference between experiencing the entire decline and the recovery. And so we're strategic about it. We don't just constantly buy insurance, but we want to utilize that insurance in a bad market environment. When markets are going up, fine. Uh, we can allow that to just kind of continue to go for the most part. But when they start to downward trend, and this is one of our pillars, technical analysis, we'll be able to determine, okay, it's in an uptrend or B, it's in a downtrend. When it's in that downtrend, that's when these protective measures become critically important. And then a lot of times, you know, we talk about the income side as well. You and I have investments together. We've we've yeah. uh, put some money together and we've done investments. And we one of the things that we love about those is that we try to pay off our investment. So, you know, we use as an example KHC Kraft Heinz. It's a stock that it got it goes hammered. nowhere, by the way. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just sideways, and it's a great example because the stock hasn't done much of anything but we've been able to generate income and pay it off in a matter of a few years. Now think yeah. about that from a real estate analogy. Imagine going out and buying a real estate property for 300 grand. And, and your then, loan is paid off in five years. Yeah. Instead of and 30. then five years later it's paid off and you still own the property. That's what you can do with the options market is you can generate income so that as your stock is not doing anything, you can pay it off. You can generate enough income that your original investment is paid back to you. I think the biggest thing, I, I'll close with this idea. Uh, when I sit down with a student and I walk them through this and I show them how, we call it click and get paid. Click a button and money hits their account. Click a button and money hits your account. 90% chance you keep all that money. Click and get paid. Yeah. The biggest reaction they have is they're like, I could have been doing this for years. Years, yeah. I could have been flying a plane, and it's not that hard to fly once you learn it, instead of riding a bicycle. My life could have been so much richer had I learned this 5, 10, 15 years ago. Well, you can't go back in time, but you can go zero to cash flow right now. So, again, take that class and see what we're talking about and see what it's like. If you have the ability to click and get paid, and you can learn how to manage those risks and have probabilities like we have, it, it just blows my mind. And people think it's about the asset class instead of the investor. And, and I'll just end with this. The, the real advantage I have is with who Corey is. I would never put my money and say, hey, mom, I'm going to be in a 401k. Let's do that together with my mom's level of knowledge. Uh, when I can do things that are incredible with someone like Corey. It's not about the asset class. You know, it's so funny. I I, I think 99% of the comments we get on the show are really great. There's always that one guy who thinks yeah. he's smart. Everybody's like, well, let me tell you what I know about. You know, it's like, well, go get your own podcast, right? Yeah. Uh, it's hilarious because it's not about the asset class. It's about the investor. You know, yeah. there's a lot of people who make money in real estate and a lot of people who lose money in real estate. So it's not the real estate. It's the investors. A lot of people who make money in stocks and lose money in stocks. It's not stocks. It's the investors. So that's why we're glad to introduce you to the uh, Rich Dad Stockcast community, Corey. Uh, I'd encourage people to learn from you as I have. You've totally changed my life. Uh, you've taught me as much about risk management as any other human being. And I'm so grateful to have you on the team and that you'd volunteer your time today to, to come and uh, talk. I'll give you the last word. If someone was uh, uneducated, didn't really understand the options. And obviously if they're losing money in options, it's because they're, if you can't crash your plane, it's because you don't know how to fly. Yeah. What would you tell a person who is new, uh, and maybe still has that fear and trepidation that you no longer feel? What would you tell that person? Yeah. I mean, it, it's beautiful because you're starting small, you know, you're going to start with a flight simulator, a practice trading account. 
and you're going to be able to see the results. You're going to be able to see your progress as you go. And you're going to be able to, to try some things out that you're learning through the process. Okay, well, let's start with buying a few shares of something in the practice trading account. Okay, now let's sell an option and generate some income. And it's amazing. I mean, it, it's so cool when people see for the first time, wait, I just clicked that button and $100 got paid to me. $200 yeah. got paid to when me. They're starting in premium. out. Small. Yeah. And it's just, it's eye opening that there's that type of capital that you can be generating on stocks you already own. And you're just missing out on that income source. And so as they go through that learning process, it's going to be this, this process where, again, as you gain that knowledge, you're going to see that the fears you have uh, start to go away because. Now, it's not about whether the market's going up, down, or sideways as to whether or not you can make money. It's whether or not time passes on, right? It's like yeah, renting out real estate. It's, it's amazing because somebody that rents out their real estate property, are they checking Zillow every day and going, oh, you know, my house, it went down in value? No, I just don't care. I've got renters in. The rent check comes in. That's what I care about. And it's the same way. The passage of time allows you to not worry about whether your stock's going up, down, or sideways in the moment because you're making money. collecting that income. Yeah, you're bringing it in month after month. That option expires. You write another cover call. That option expires. You bring in that premium, and it's like collecting rent. But the economies of scale are pretty cool because where real estate requires a lot of capital, you can get involved in the financial markets with small, small amounts of capital. You could go out and start owning 100 shares of stock with 500 bucks of capital, with $1,000 of capital. It's hard to get involved in a lot of real estate projects when you're starting that small. With the, with the stock market, it's very easy to start generating some income, even on smaller amounts of capital. Well, Corey, we thank you for hanging out. I hope you'll come back sometime, and I hope love people it. will... We'll make yeah. the choice to learn from you and uh, just just wonderful to be with you and, and so much gratitude in, in having you come with us. Uh, write down in the comments, everybody, the things you'd like. If you'd like Corey back, let us know. If you have questions you'd like him to answer, let us know and uh, things you'd like me to touch on. We, risk, we wish Greg uh, a safe uh, return back so we can get back on the stock cast with us. Uh, until next time, I'm Andy Tanner. Go get educated. And uh, we'll see you next time. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.